Kia ora guys, welcome back to the 2.5 Genetic Variation and Change video series. This is video 5. In this video you'll be learning about meiosis as a source of genetic variation and by the end of this lesson you should be able to discuss the mechanisms for generating four genetically unique gametes. So these include crossing over, independent assortment and segregation and I can guarantee that there will be a merit or excellence question about this video in your exams. So in video 4 you learned that in meiosis a cell with two sets of chromosomes divides twice to produce four genetically unique haploid daughter cells or gametes and each gamete only has one set of chromosomes. So meiosis has two outcomes or results. The first is that meiosis reduces the chromosome number. It's the first division, meiosis 1, that the chromosome number is reduced from diploid to haploid, from two sets of chromosomes to just one set of chromosomes. And the second outcome is that meiosis produces genetic variation. Meiosis produces four genetically unique gametes through those three processes that I said before, crossing over, independent assortment, and segregation. These three events cause genetic variation by mixing alleles into new combinations. So let's start with the first cause of genetic variation called crossing over, also known as recombination. So when homologous pairs of chromosomes pair up at the early stages of meiosis 1, crossing over can occur. So crossing over is the exchange of corresponding genetic material between non-sister inward facing homologous chromosomes or chromatids. So that was quite a mouthful. What do I actually mean by non-sister inward facing homologous chromosomes or chromatids? If we look at this picture, non-sister inward facing homologous chromosomes or chromatids are referring to these two chromatids indicated by this box. They're non-sister chromatids because they are not identical because one chromosome comes from mum, let's say the green one, and the other chromosome or chromatid comes from dad. They are inward facing meaning they are the inside chromatids. This is compared with the outward phasing chromosomes or chromatids here on the outside. And finally, they're homologous chromosomes or chromatids because they're the same length, they have the same centromere location, and they would have the same banding patterns if they were stained here, but they're not. Also, they would contain the same genes, but they're not identical because those genes would have different alleles because mum would probably look different to dad. So these inward facing chromatids from each homologue of the homologous pair participates in this crossing over event where this involves the exchange of corresponding whole groups of genes. What do I mean by corresponding? I mean that the same genes are crossed over between the homologous chromatids. So for example, 50 genes at the very tip of this green chromatid is swapped over for the 50 genes at the very tip of this purple chromatid. It's not 50 genes from the tip of this green and 100 genes from the tip of this purple. It has to be the corresponding genes that are crossed over. During crossing over, two non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes are seen to be interlocked at these points called chiasmata. Chiasmata is a plural version of the noun. The singular version of the noun is chiasma and you would have learnt about this word in video um, 4. A chiasma is the actual visible result of crossing over and part of each non-sister chromatid breaks off and rejoins the other non-sister chromatid. So for this blue arm it would swap for this red arm and it would now become, so originally it was big B, big B, but due to crossing over, it would now become big B, little B for this homologue. And as a result, crossing over recombines or shuffles maternal and paternal genes. As a result of crossing over, 
the inward-facing chromatids become hybrids, each containing maternal and paternal fragments. So this picture clearly shows that the inward-facing chromosomes now have two colours, and this represents the mix of maternal and paternal DNA, while the outward-facing chromosomes, so this one here and this one here, still just have one colour, representing no mixture between maternal and paternal DNA. The DNA remains unaltered by crossing over. Now it's important to know that the rearranged chromatids, so the inward facing chromatids, the hybrids, are officially called recombinants. I haven't got the word in the slide but it should be here. So um, those chromatids that participate in crossing over are now called recombinants. The non-recombinant chromatids, so these ones, stay unaltered by crossing over. So when the homologues separate at meiosis 1, and then when the sister chromatids separate at meiosis 2, those non-recombinant chromatids and the recombinant chromatids will be passed on into the gametes. And the gametes containing the non-recombinant chromatids will also be called non-recombinant gametes, and the gametes containing the recombinant chromatids are called the recombinant gametes. After crossing over, all four chromatids in a homologous pair are now genetically unique. None of them are identical anymore. The four gametes produced are therefore not genetically identical either. And this increases genetic variation. Now let's talk about the second cause of genetic variation, segregation. Segregation is another word for separate. Remember that organisms that reproduce sexually inherit at least two versions of the gene called alleles. So in this example, there are two versions of the gene, the big L and the little L. We'll talk about this example more later. The law of segregation states that the two alleles for a gene segregate or separate during gamete formation and end up in different gametes. Strictly speaking, this law of segregation is specific to just the alleles on homologous chromosomes. This is the opposite of independent assortment, as you'll learn about shortly. During meiosis II, the two alleles for every gene segregate or separate randomly, and only one of each allele ends up in the gamete. This random segregation of alleles for a gene is referred to as segregation. So in this picture here, there is a make-believe gene for lumpiness, L, in this make-believe organism. Both parents are heterozygous for this lumpy gene, which means they both have the dominant lumpy allele, as well as the recessive not lumpy allele. In this example, segregation is the fact that each parent's two alleles go into separate gametes. So here, let's look at um, this parent's alleles. They've got the big L and the little L. And you can see that the big L will go into separate gametes to the little L. So the big L goes into this gamete, this gamete, while the little L goes into this gamete and this gamete. They never meet in the same gamete. That is what segregation is. How does segregation of alleles produce genetically unique gametes for sexual reproduction? Well, first of all, the gametes only contain half the number of chromosomes, which makes it unique from the parent cell. Second of all, each gamete gets a different combination of alleles. So for example, here is an organism with three homologous pairs of chromosomes. The orange homologous pair, the blue homologous pair, and the green homologous pair. And within each homologous pair, there are two alleles. This allele and this allele for this gene. This allele which is different from this allele, which are in the same genes. Alleles for the same gene get separated, and they end up in different chromosomes. So for this homologous chromosome, this allele goes, segregates into this gamete, while this green allele segregates into these gametes down here. They never end up in the same gamete. And so the resulting gametes end up containing half the number of chromosomes, which makes it unique from the parent, because the parent has um, one, two, three, four, five, six chromosomes, whereas the gametes only contain three chromosomes. And so all of the gametes are genetically unique from the parent. And 
each gamete gets a different combination of alleles. So none of these gametes are alike. And now let's talk about the third cause of genetic variation, independent assortment. For you to understand independent assortment, you have to apply your knowledge of segregation, which is that the two alleles for a gene are separated or segregated into different gametes. So in this picture, the big A allele and the little a allele have to segregate into two different gametes. This is also the case with the big B allele and the little b allele. They have to segregate into two different gametes. Now, independent assortment considers the segregation of alleles from two or more genes at a time. And the law of independent assortment states that each pair of alleles segregate independently of all other pairs of alleles on non-homologous chromosomes. So in contrast to what I said about segregation, this law of independent assortment just applies to genes on non-homologous chromosomes. So in this picture, let's consider independent assortment of alleles from these two genes, gene A and gene B, when an individual who is heterozygous for both gene A and gene B undergoes meiosis. With the law of independent assortment, we know that the gene A pair of alleles will segregate independently of the gene B pair of alleles, thus producing these possible genotypes in the gametes. So for example, the big A allele has a 50-50 chance of ending up in a gamete with the big B or with the little b allele. If there was an independent assortment, if different genes didn't segregate randomly, then the big A allele would always segregate with the big B allele, and it would never segregate with the little b allele. So with independent assort assortment, there's more genetic variation in the gametes, and without independent assortment, there would be less genetic variation in the gametes. So how does independent assortment actually happen? How do non-homologous chromosomes actually independently or randomly segregate from one another. These are the notes you can flick back to, but I'm going to go through a picture of it in the next slide. So independent assortment, the random segregation of non-homologous chromosomes, happen during meiosis because every time the chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate, they do so independently of every other homologous pair. So these two homologous pairs are lining up independently of these two homologous pairs and every other homologous pair that they, they might exist. And the way the homologous pairs line up is random, with an equal chance of each homolog orienting towards either pole. And therefore there's an equal chance for each homolog to go into either of the daughter cells or gametes in the end. So let's look at this picture more closely. Every homologous pair can line up in two ways. So like the shorter homologous pair of chromosomes could either line up with the blue chromosome towards the left pole or the red chromosome towards the right pole. Or it could line up with the red chromosome towards the left hand side and the blue chromosome towards the right hand side. That's why in this scenario of just two homologous chromosomes, so one homologous chromosome and two homologous chromosomes, there are two possibilities due to independent assortment. And so a cell with just two pairs of homologous chromosomes would produce two times two equals four possible gametes through this independent assortment. And if that's just for two homologous pairs, think about the genetic variation in humans who have 23 homologous pairs. So because humans have 23 homologous pairs of chromosomes, a human cell could produce two to the power of 23 different kinds of gametes by independent assortment. This equals over 9 million possible combinations of alleles. And so independent assortment creates a huge number of possible chromosome combinations for each gamete. Well done, you've reached the end of this video. So by now you should be able to discuss the mechanisms for generating four genetically unique gametes. And this is in terms of crossing over, independent assortment and segregation. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.